God help. Well, before, before we do that, Pete, you know, what was your, you had a, a different view of the race as well. What did you make of it? Quite a costly mistake for Banyaya in the end. In what is a, a really crucial sort of time amongst the Ducati riders? It was, wasn't it? You know, he just got this win, had the bad start to the year. He'd won at, um, you know, Jerez really dominantly and looked looked great, back on form, looking to build momentum, as you, as you said in your introduction, Harry. Even if he didn't win the race, he was on course for a pretty pretty safe podium, even if he couldn't catch Bastianini. And then instead, you know, what is he, 46 points from the lead now? And and it's 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 a tricky situation we're seeing for Ducati. I mean, in a, of course, they love to see Bastianini on a Ducati up there, but you've got the three guys at the front, Quattararo, uh, Aleish and uh, Bastianini, and then there's a bit of a gap, isn't there, to uh, to the others. So, so the only guy at the moment in the fight is on last year's Ducati. Now, what do you do about that? Do you, do you start developing last year's Ducati, sending Piro out, the test rider, to maybe try and help Bastianini, or or do you rely on your factory guys, you know, getting that GP22 ahead in the second half of the season? Keith explained why last year's bike can be, you know, a better option. But I think we're, we're now, we've now had seven rounds. You know, we kind of expected the GP22 to sort of cross over and become the clear favourite bike, I guess, round now or before now. Instead, we're seeing three wins for Bastianini. No one else has won more than one race. I think it's, uh, you know, the, the, the beast is back again, isn't he? But I think I always, I, I keep juggling back and forth. What's the biggest shock of this year? Is it Bastianini or is it Aleish? You know, and it, and it keeps going, <laughs> you know, Aleish gets the win and now he gets the podiums and then Bastianini again. You know, both of them outstanding so far this year. On that, it might be worth uh, moving on to a bit of Moto2 action. We'll come back to some more MotoGP in a moment. But in Moto2 at the weekend at Le Mans, Augusto Fernandes inherited the lead and, well, never looked back, really, as he powered away to victory ahead of uh, Aaron Canna and Somkiat Chantro's first win uh, since 2019 after Pedro Acosta slid out of contention. He secured pole, Keith, even though he slid out do you think this is a bit of a breakthrough weekend for Pedro, who we know is brilliantly fast? Yeah, I think so. I think it's taken him a little longer than he would have expected, and certainly some of us would have expected. We, you know, there's a little bit of smart money on him at the beginning of the year for, for achieving perhaps a bit more than he has done. But Acosta, you're never going to write off a talent like that this soon. I mean, he is a sharp little, you know, rider. Disaster for Dixon. I mean, I think about the Brits more than anything. You know, <laughs> Dixon crashing out. Um, yep. Obviously, Sam Lowe's yep. banging his head. He's um, withdrawn from the race again. It's it's Le Mans. You know, it's a it's a it's an awful place to go, Le Mans. When when you know you you really looking for a result there. It's the French Grand Prix. It's an important round, even though the track itself, you know, the Bugatti track is not you know a favourite for for most riders, but it is one that sort of you can you can see you can sort of eke out a result out of that place. It's one of them ones where you always get a slight shock in the result. I think Bastianini was a shock for the for the win, considering what had happened in the week. Um, I, I was really rooting for a Dixon win. I got this feeling that that Jake was going to make that work, but he's he's really going to have to dig in now and make it work for him. But Acosta, you know, you you can't keep a good man down, and he's he'll, he'll be on his way soon. And a bit further back, I thought Bobier, fantastic comeback all the way through to fourth, almost got that first podium. Mm -hmm. I thought that was great. Another rider under pressure, maybe Vietti. You know, the, the results haven't been there. They, it was another good comeback, but still, he's, he's losing a lot of points. But is it 16 now, the gap to Agura in the championship, going into his home round? So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of pressure on his shoulders at uh, Mugello in two weeks. Right? It certainly will be. Uh, Vietti with 108 points at the moment, ahead of Agura, 92, Canet in third, Arbolino and uh, Augusto Fernandez, the top five in Moto2. Uh, over in Moto3, well, as uh, hectic and, and bizarre as ever, Jama Messia led uh, well, a bit of a thrilling uh, Moto3 French Grand Prix over the line for his second win of the season. Shortened race after that red flag with the the turn 14 sort of spits of rain incident, which saw Garcia, Guevara, Ricardo Rossi, um, Migno all slide out and into the gravel. Uh, thankfully, uh, all OK. But uh, another bit of a bizarre uh, Moto3, Keith. But a uh, uh, good result for Jama Masia. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, it's awkward when it's like that. And again, mm. it's the French Grand Prix. And quite often, you know, the first, first race of the day, and if the weather is a little bit iffy, it's a problem. For me, the highlight is, is John McPhee. John McPhee coming back, qualified, I think it was 12th, finishing 12th. Okay, no one's going to say that's great. Um, but I think it was because he's been away for such a long time with that back injury. 
and to come back in iffy conditions and get himself well into the points, I think that was um, it was a good ride. It was a good ride for McPhee. So I'm I'm feeling quite positive about John McPhee you know, off the back of a whole load of negativity from previous um, weeks and months because John needs to now get this job done. He needs to perform like he's never performed before or we're going to lose him to to, Moto G, to to Grand Prix racing because all the slots in, in Moto2 are going to be tight as. There's going to be so many riders that are going to be going to Moto2 and that's his only option. He won't be able to go up into MotoGP. There's not not any. There's not a gap anywhere that's going to take McPhee on. So is there a Moto2 team that's going to take him? The only way they're going to take him is if he proves that he's a you know podium regular podium material um, because he's 28 now, and obviously there's a cutoff. You know the Moto3 cutoff. You you can't. You won't be able to go back into Moto3 in uh, 2023. Uh, 50 year old, by the way, is the the cutoff for um, MotoGP and uh, Moto2, unless they've changed it in recent months. I think it's 50. Oh, um, so you can still do it. Remarkable... Pardon me? You can still do it then. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my IQ that's 50. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, my, my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite funny when you're doing commentary for the Northwest and you've got Rutter and McGuinness and, uh, nose to tail out on the track and there's 100 years between them. Wow. wow. They're, they're both 50. They're both 50 years old. <laughs> um, still so, got it. They, you know, they've still got it. And then you've got Jeremy McWilliams, who's 58 years old and still doing the business. So, um, But the, the cutoff for Grand Prix, quite rightly, by the way, um, is 50 years old, um, apart from Moto3, which is 28. It, well, you, can be 20, you can be 28 after the season started, which Mafi was, but you can't start a year. You just won't um, be able to come funny. back. Um, yeah, well, as you as you rightly say, big big week, a uh, big weekend, and a, a big rest of the year for for McPhee. Um, Dennis Foger, Pete, um, dominated well ahead of Sunday. Uh, he got his first ever pole position, which I was a bit surprised to read actually, but it, it was his first ever pole position. Um, but managed fourth in the end. But Foger has just been a bit sort of hit and more miss really in the early part of the season, particularly as we thought, well, you know, coming from last year, he would be right up there challenging and, and probably leading the title you'd expect. You would have expected that. Yeah. And as you say, Harry dominated the weekend, uh, you know, going into the race, but then well, you got, once you got those spots of rain on the grid, you could kind of see him looking up at the sky and, and, and he clearly wasn't comfortable. So <laughs> oh God. Uh, of course, then it was red flagged and it was restarted. So it was like, okay. And, and then he was leading, I think at the start of the last lap and, and dropped to fourth. So I think if anyone could feel sort of pickpocketed, it was him. So yeah, he went from dominating the weekend to not even getting a podium. But uh, you know, he's still up there in the championship, isn't he? I think he's what seventeen points behind Garcia. Garcia, as you say, Harry, was one of those guys that got lucky with the red flag because he'd already fallen. Gravard already fallen. They rushed back. You could see them rushing to, the, before the race had been stopped, rushing to get their bikes back to the pits to avoid that situation in Portimao where they might miss the five minute, you know, restart rule. Uh, so they, you know, they were back in time, and all riders were eligible for the restart. Original grid position, so so Foggy was on pole again for the restart, and uh, yeah, just just sort of, you know, it, it was all going great until the last lap of the race after after a great weekend. So, yeah, you know, he's still in there though. That's the thing. But but Masia and and the IO team definitely momentum is on their side. He is still in there. He's third at the moment, ninety five points, tied with Jamal Masia, who's second, and Sergio Garcia. Uh, topping the standings at the moment with 112 points. So a uh, long way to go still in this season. <laughs> so And Moto3, as we all know, we cannot predict it. We cannot predict anything in MotoGP, let alone Moto3. <laughs> and actually on that, I believe from last weekend, we have all got a point on the board for our podium Ooh. predictions. It could have been more because Keith, well, if Banyaya had uh, held out, you would have had an extra point on top, but you managed to get Miller. So he was on your podium. So you get one point for that. Same for you, Pete, also Miller. Um, our French contingents just didn't really, quarter I mean, Quattro <laughs> nearly did, but Zarco didn't didn't quite show up. Alicia Spargro, a point for me back on the podium once again so we all get a point cool. what does that do for our standings i think so keith now because i know you all love the standings in in the crash uh motor gp podcast keith you're on seven points pete you're second with four and i'm in third with three so keith is starting to edge away a little bit now so we you know but long season ahead could anything could happen <laughs> Um, let's come back to MotoGP, shall we? And uh, talk about more things we can't predict. Um, the Ducati decision, <laughs> uh, it's something, you know, we did speak about it 
last weekend, but it feels important to do it again because 